Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth episode of the Area 1 Young Rider podcast. So far, we've met with the Area 1 Young Rider Committee, we've chatted about safety and eventing with Bevan Dugan, and today, we will be diving into what exactly goes into making a stadium and cross-country course. So, we'll be chatting with course designer Janine McLean. So, Janine, could you just introduce yourself and let the listeners know just a little bit about who you are and what you're doing right now? Hi, I am Janine McLean, and um, I have been a course designer since just the beginning of the course design program. Um, So in the early 90s is when I became a course designer. Um, So I do uh, cross-country courses and some show jumping courses, um, setting up events, and um, just the responsibility is basically knowing where all the jumps are going to go for any given event. And I've done a lot in Area 1. I've done some in uh, Area 2 um and in in the past in area three as well so i am ready to ask and answer anything that you guys want to know about if i can (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's awesome i I didn't know so course designing started kind of in the 90s yes yes there was uh that's when we started to get um an official uh qualification program going on so um, early on, it was really people that knew how to ride and um, people who were willing to just go ahead and do the work. So prior to, I think, must have been like 93 or 4 is when uh, an official called the course designer began. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. So yeah. could you just give the listeners who might not know full well um, an explanation of what a course designer is? Sure. Um, <clears throat> course designer is a proper official. Um, we're trained with uh, education programs and continuing ed. Uh, we are responsible for actually, in fact, ultimately every single jump that is on an event ground that is being used in the competition. So we have to know uh, where all the jumps are, and that includes the show jumping, the cross country, and all the warm-up areas. Um, We are trained really in the cross country phase uh, most significantly. Um, We're called eventing course designers, and um, we think about what we want to do for a given event we figure out what that event looks like in terms of um, uh, the map, the ground, the hills, the lighting, all that sort of thing, um, where it is relative to all the other phases. Um, We make up courses, we supervise setting the courses, um, and we are ultimately uh, expected to know um, about the show jumping as well. Uh, Originally, the cross country course designer would set the show jumping as well. Then recently we've come to um, utilize specific show jump course designers. Um, But the cross country slash eventing designer has to be responsible for making sure it's all um, properly set up. Awesome. So out of curiosity, how did you get into eventing? Like what introduced you to it? Um, well, when I was a kid, I rode the crazy, you know, run around on the trails and fall off and ride bareback and, you know, play cowboys and Indians and do all that kind of thing. Um, and then as I got into my sort of early teens, I rode hunters and jumpers. And, um, then I went to UNH and UNH really was my official introduction to eventing. Um, Janet Briggs ran a program there and she amazingly has, uh, produced a number of people in the sport that are still participating as judges, volunteers, um, TDs, course designers. So a lot of people that came through the UNH program under Janet Briggs are still really involved in the sport, especially in area one, which is great fun. And, um, a lot of us went to school together. So I got introduced to eventing as a competitive sport for myself there. That's really interesting. UNH puts on some great events still. 
Yeah, it is. It's it's so fun. It's wonderful to uh, have it hang in there and and you know just keep on going because it really did offer and does offer a great education in the light horse sciences and um, you know just running an event and getting some experience and doing all of the stuff that goes along with that. Yeah, definitely. So I have a feeling this is going to be tricky because there's so many of them, but do you have a favorite cross-country jump? You know, I was thinking about that, <laughs> and I think my favorite cross-country jump is a triple uh, triple brush wedge. Oh, I, That is the coolest jump because uh, the shape of it is sort of a ramped shape. It's also a narrow jump. And it has brush on it. So it has all kinds of useful aspects. Um, so, you know, uh, the brush is great because you can make it big. And um, the narrowness is great because it demands a lot of accuracy. And the shape of it is great because it's um, it's got a sloped face. So it's got a basically a a jumpable shape, which uh, en enables the horses to be able to get up in the air. And um, you can use it in all sorts of ways to teach about steering and kind of get educated about narrow jumps, um, starting from little beginner novice ones to uh, advanced ones. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful jump uh, for educating horses and riders. Oh, that's super interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of jumps that are cool, but um, yeah. I, I, I really like, I like the, the triple brush wedge shape. That's cool. I'll have to look that one up. So, yeah. I'm, you know, I know all of them are different in their own awesome ways, but do you have a favorite Area 1 event venue that you've designed for in the past? Um, I don't know that I have a favorite. Um, I think they're all great. I think... Um, they, they, each place is different and, um, each place offers unique opportunities and challenges. Uh, you know, open, open fields are different than woods and hills and all of that stuff. So, um, they each have their great features. Um, one of the cool things in area one is woods and hills and natural water. Yeah. So, um, you know, that is, that's, that is, there's so many good, great things. Out of, here. Out of curiosity, could you name a couple of the ones in the area that you've designed for? Um, I've done GMHA uh, a lot in the past. Yeah. And, um, Hitching Post and um, um, Huntington most recently, which has been a really fun project to get that going again. Um, I have looked at G, uh, uh, UNH as a design project, but I didn't actually get that to you know didn't get to do that particular event um yeah i don't know i've done some other ones in area two and area three also that are completely different yeah that's cool so i was kind of wondering what goes into like the planning process for a cross-country course like are you going to the area and mapping it out are you doing it from home is there like a you know like an online program like how are you planning it Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I think the first thing you have to do is go there yeah. and you have to be on the on the ground and, in you know, on the dirt, feel what it feels like and um, see what kind of uh, footing there is. Uh, you can't really plan unless you have a feel for, you know, where you can and can't go physically. So um, step one would be to be on site. Once you've designed there a couple times, I think um, you have a somewhat of an idea of where you really can't go. So you can start to uh, do some work at home on maps. Um, you can use either, you know, you can use computer programs or you can use paper, which I do a lot, of course, because I've been doing it a long time. And that's, you know, the way I started. So for me, it's a it's a it's an easy way to work. Um, and um so you kind of uh, get a feel for the place. Then you can get a track. And I always start with the higher level and go downward from there. Um, you have to have a specific, uh, you know, there's specific distances that you have to stay either, you know, not less than and not more than certain numbers of meters. Um, so really the, 
most important part is the making sure you have enough in this distance and it's not too long for, say, the preliminary, which is the the level that I'm designing at uh, highest at these specific events, and then um, go down from there. You got to be able to fit everything in. You have to be able to, everybody has to squeeze in one place or, you know, expand somewhere else. And um, so you can play around with different tracks. So you start with a track, uh, then you can add your jumps in, making sure that you have, again, the specified numbers of jumps. Um, and, you know, thinking about the way everything looks together. So there's a visual sort of um, aesthetic to it. Um, and, you know, those are some of the considerations, like how do they fit? What do they look like? Um, and, you know, how do they relate to each other in terms of difficulty where the preliminary is the harder one and then the modified is sort of leading up to that, training leads up to that, and obviously leads up to that, beginner novice, you know, leads in. in. And the intro um, phase is, is coming up here soon too, so that'll all be factored in that makes a lot of jumps in one spot yeah <laughs> so yeah just fitting everything in is is a, an interesting exercise um i do lots of drawings and sort of positioning in in my imagination and then go out in the field and see what that's actually going to look like i use a lot of uh marker flags to sort of position where a jump might be and then walk around and say, okay, well, I can fit another one here and I can fit another one there, but I can't fit this one here. So I have to move this back or forward. So I do a lot of just sort of uh, walking and looking and deciding what will fit where and what kind of angles they have to go on. Yeah, I never thought about how much a course designer would have to consider for this. Mm, yeah, yeah, you have to consider so many things. Um, you know, the, the flow of the each track has to be sort of doable and inviting and make sense, but they all sort of sit together and go along together and then separate and come back together. So, um, you know, there's a lot to think about, like, what's what are you looking at when you're jumping this jump? Um, you know, where are you going next? What's in your way? Where did you come from? You know, all that sort of thing. So it's a lot of looking and changing and sort of adjusting things. Yeah. So I was actually just thinking, how do you come up with, because you have to come up with like an optimum time and like a maximum and minimum. Do you do that? Yep. Yep. Um, that's one of the key things. When you start imagining what track you might want, you then have to get to the site and actually measure the track. Like we use GPS. Mm. Um, you, we used to always use a wheel, so you'd have to, you know, use a, uh, measuring wheel, um, however many times you were going around, like, you know, five times or four times or three times, depending on how many tracks you were doing. Um, and now we have the GPS, so you can do it a little bit quicker just to get, make sure that you don't have a too long or too short of a course before you actually commit. Um, and I never set a start box exactly or a finish line exactly until I know exactly what my distances are. So I can make some adjustments at the beginning and at the end if I am too long or too short. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And then we know exactly where we want the riders to go. Like we will plan like we're going to go from one to two and it's a big arc to the right. You know, and, and we don't draw a straight line from one to two. We make it, we measure the arc that we want the riders to go on, um, which is always based on um, safety and sensibility and, you know, making sure that you ride a turn comfortably um, and all of that stuff. So, so the distance that you'll see for uh, any given course is what the course designer hopes the riders will do to get around smoothly. So um, then we take that distance and we multiply it by whatever speed we want the riders to go at. Um, and there's specified speeds, um, you know, between 300 and 400 or whatever uh, that you can use for any given level. 
So you decide what speed that's going to be because it might be spring and nobody's going to go too fast or it might be a really sort of open course and you want everybody to go to the fastest uh, allowable or maybe it's, you know, very complicated and you want them to take their time so you go on the slowest uh, speed that you're allowed. But then you do a calculation that gives you the optimum time. And then there's speed, there's speed fault times and time limits. So those things are all in the, in the rule book, um, in the appendixes. So you can see what those are, but that I refer to those things all the time just to make sure I've, you know, I've got the right numbers, (laughs) a lot of math. I'm sure when you had to use that wheel to measure it all out, that must've taken forever. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You, you know, if you do use it, the more specific you want to be, the 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 more likely you are to use a wheel, like in the at the advanced levels for say Kentucky or you know somewhere uh, you know in an FEI event. The course designers will often walk with a wheel, hmm. and because you can get much more accurate um, calculations with a wheel because it actually rolls along on every lump and bump in the ground. Yeah. You really get a, an accurate, um, real distance. The GPS, you can drive around in a, you know, on a four wheeler or something and get your general, uh, distances. So, you know, you're being within the proper, um, uh, lengths of course, but then you would be very specific and measure very carefully ultimately before you publish that final distance because you want to do it as 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 accurately as possible before you publish so you don't you don't necessarily you know start out on two weeks ahead of time figuring out what you're going to do and go with that distance you'll wait until the very last minute when the td has looked at it and the td will always check your distance and um, make sure that you're sure that you're you're accurate according to what it looks like he thinks you might want the riders to do so it's pretty interesting that way, but it's, it's very much, you know, everybody sort of comes up with the same result. So everybody's usually pretty happy with things. And if not, we make adjustments. We might move a jump. We might take a jump out. We might shift something around before three o'clock on Friday, you know, when the course opens. So yeah, there's lots of checks and balances. Yeah. So going back to the planning process, I was kind of curious, how does the planning process for a cross-country course differ from the planning process for a stadium course? Um, well, I would say there's a lot of similarities in the sense that you are going to look at where you start, where you finish, you know, how you're related to your warm-up, how you're related to your, uh, you know, your trailer parking and getting to somewhere and getting back from somewhere going from one phase to another. Um, so you're always going to look at what is, uh, what's the background look like? Um, in the show jumping, you've got an arena, it's enclosed. It might have black fencing. It might have white fencing. It might have, um, you know, just a tape fence on it. Um, you might be looking at some cows. You might be looking at, you know, a mountain. You might be looking at a building. So when you plan your show jumping course, you're going to always consider, you know, what are you looking at when you're jumping the jump? Um, how does the turn work? Um, and it, things come up much faster. So there's certain uh, limits and certain, um, oh, sensitivities, I say, uh, to the show jumping because everything happens so much faster. Um, all the jumps are closer together. You're in a tighter space. Um, you're, you're riding at a slower speed, um, generally speaking. Uh, and so also in area one, sometimes there is terrain involved with the show jumping as well, which is pretty significant. Um, going a little bit uphill or a little bit downhill does affect the way distances ride and the way jumps come up and how, you know, what shape and size you want your jumps to be. Um, you know, an oxer versus, versus a vertical will uh, will be placed differently according to even just like how the ground is in your show jumping. So, um, very it's very similar, um, but they they are two different phases. They're two different um, skill sets. 
So um, that stuff t- is taken into account. It's all related in the show jumping. Um, in the cross country, a lot of it's related, but not in such a quick way. Um, so those the distances and numbers of strides and all of that sort of thing in the show jumping is really key to plan for and set for. Um, that maybe is the main, you know, the main real difference is, is how specific you have to be. And that's, it's truly specific. <laughs> so, um, yeah. That's really cool how, like, how technical all this is. That's super interesting. Yeah, yeah, it really is. There's an awful lot of things to think about. Um, you know, you're going to think about what the weather is going to be. You're going to think about uh, what time of day each level is running because you can have shadows affect things. Um, you know, you're thinking about what time of year it is, uh, what event just did everybody come from, and what event are they going to next? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. That's super cool. So mm. how how do you go about <laughs> setting up the course itself? Like, and especially, like, are you building new jumps? What's going on with all of that? Um, going about setting up the jumps, um, you know, we, each venue has sort of permanent features. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, GMHA has like six different water crossings through the stream, things like that. So you, you're, you're working with given circumstances. Um, so you are always considering what exists on the ground. Um, and like, where's the hill? Where's the water crossing? Where are the ditches? Where are the banks? The things that are built permanently into the ground. Um, and then we use a lot of portable jumps on the cross country. Uh, they're built to specific sizes for certain levels. Um, they're most often built by jump builders these days, professional jump builders who really have techniques and specs and all kinds of uh, great skills. They're incredible um, artists and uh, carpenters, the guys that build the build the jumps for us. And we usually collaborate. Um, you know, uh, we'll say, oh, we should have some more house-shaped jumps or we should have some more open oxers or we should have a little bit of uh, some new jumps, but we can't afford to build fancy ones, so let's get a 16 logs and build some log jumps. Um, and so a lot of that is based on how much money there is in a budget for organizers to spend on uh, sort of upgrading their courses, keeping current with sort of new trends, um, trying to, you know, do the latest um, sensible building shapes and all of the things that we learn as we go along. So um, we do build jumps. We try to build jumps so that maybe each time you go out, you get to see one or two new jumps um, so that it keeps it interesting. And um, riders and competitors are expecting some, you know, some new stuff all the time so that they keep their their uh, competition skills, you know, up with the times and um, learning new things and, ref- and fr- you know, freshness and, and uh, kind of fun new stuff. So we do, um, we do build quite a bit. Uh, sometimes we build permanent jumps, sometimes, which are the ones that are stuck in the ground, dug with holes or, you know, made with tractors and um, uh, that sort of thing. So, but then the jump builders will often build and bring the jumps to the site. Sometimes they come and build the jumps on the site and then we take them out with tractors. And like, I will say, okay, I want fence one to be here and I want it to be angled this way. So I'll stand on the ground and I'll sort of indicate an angle um, based on what, you know, what I want like the next jump to be and what the arc should be and what's in the background and all that. So then the, um, somebody will drive a tractor with carrying a jump on forks and set it on the ground and we'll, you know, say, okay, that's good. Or let's push it a little left or a little right. So there's some um, mechanical setup done with machinery. Um, and um, sometimes, you know, 
uh, somebody will just set the jumps themselves if they're the uh, course designer and the builder. Um, so there's one person involved. Um, and you, you're always going to, as a course designer, look at that jump in place as if you're going to jump it yourself and say, okay, this feels comfortable. I think this is good. Or, oh, there's a hole on the left side. Let's move it over to the right a little bit. Um, so there's, uh, the, again, looking boots on the ground, making sure you know as many things as you can about the footing and the direction and all of that. So, um, so we, you know, it takes us several days to set that kind of, a, you know, do that setup with the portable jumps, even if we don't build anything new. It's a, it's a number of days to, to get everything in place. And, um, sometimes, and we adjust things, you know, three days in, we'll go, oh, whoops, that didn't work. Or, you know, that's too tight. Or that's, you know, making them think they jumped the beginner novice after they jumped their jump or whatever. So, um, lots of shifting and moving. Um, yeah. So physical, just getting out there and seeing where things go and using machinery. Yeah, that's so cool. You know, you kind of mentioned something about, you know, keeping it, like, trendy and fun, and that just, I couldn't help but think, um, I think it was Millbrook, earlier in this season, um, at one of their competitions, they customized one of their jumps, they painted it all pink, and um, they decorated it, they decorated it, and they had, like, a Barbie jump, and I thought that was yep. so funny and so creative. <laughs> it's so great, I know, it is, I remember that jump, that was wonderful, um, but yeah, it is, it's really fun to, um, you know, to be creative that way. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and that's that. It, that's one of the greatest things is you know there's a lot of aesthetics and um, just some fun ideas and and um, you know like setting a bunch of house jumps to make it look like a village or whatever like that. So there's there's all sorts of fun things like that. So yeah, the Barbie jump that was great. <laughs> <laughs> so when it's kind of back to the planning process, I guess. But when you're planning a course. As the designer, what are you trying to factor in about safety for the horse and the rider? And, you know, like, could you maybe think of, think of like, an example of an unsafe course design? Um, let's see. Safety is, like, the number one thing. Yeah. Uh, gotta say. Um, always, always. And, um, we, we're constantly concerned with that. Everybody is. And, um, so course designers talk to each other. Um, we learn from each other. We observe what other people have done. Um, we get information from our mentors about what they think is, you know, something don't do this or don't do that or whatever. You know, we've, saw, we've seen problems with this or that. So you try to gather and keep your ears open for every bit of information you can about what works safety wise and what's not so smart. Um, so, uh, you know, the other factor with that is um, that when the TD and the head of the ground jury judge comes to see the event right before it gets opened up for everybody to walk, um, the the TD gets there the day earlier and does a lot of measuring and, and, um, and anything that is um, uncomfortable to that person. Uh, is brought to the attention of the course designer. Anything that the course designer has a question about, maybe, what do you think about this? Uh, we'll say to the TD, you know, what do you think about this? And then they'll have a discussion. If um, when the, the head of the ground jury gets there, they take a look at everything and everybody discusses everything and um, comes to a comfortable place with where everything is. So um, there's not just one set of eyes on the situation. Uh, the other factor is that we have the rider reps and we invite them to come and, you know, take a good look around so that they get a feel for what the course looks like. Um, and then we, you know, we encourage riders to say, oh, I don't like this to the rider rep and the rider rep will meet with the officials and say, we don't like this. And then everybody decides, should it, change should it not change um so a lot of um cooperation and collaboration goes into the final product um and you know we hope that people will speak up if they don't like something um and have a discussion about things um 
I've seen riders at the very top levels go to the course designer and say, what do you think I should, what do, you know, what are you thinking here? Are you um, thinking we should do this in five or four uh, or, you know, like that so that there is a, there should be a comfort level in competitors asking questions saying, how, how am I supposed to ride this even to the course designer? You know, and the course designer will say, says something like, well, I think you should come out of the trees over here, line up with this, come around the corner, you know, jump it here and bend over here in five strides or whatever. So there's, there's conversation um, as much as we can keep that going on. I think uh, we need to really encourage everybody to feel free to um, um, speak up and, and have discussions if there's something that's, you know, uncomfortable or questionable. So I would say that um, um, everybody's interested in safety, most of all. Um, so, you know, um, there's guidelines, there's rules. We refer to those things all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, we as designers want success. We want everybody to, to win and everybody to be happy and learn something and um, enjoy, you know, the fun sport that that we have. So it's it's uh, definitely um, everyone's always continuously working on safety. Um, yeah, so unsafe course design. I don't know. I think um, I think that we are learning so much about shapes of jumps um, that in the past we've seen jumps that are built sort of big square, you know, super wide, straight up and down vertical with a sharp front edge, you know, like a table or something like that. Um, we've learned over time that we really should be softening the front edges of the jumps. We should be identifying the front edges of the jumps. Um, probably a, a bad idea is kind of a long, straight downhill approach, not necessarily steep downhill, but even just sort of descending ground to a big square um, table with the flags in the middle on, on each side of it, or um, the, the ideal you would have a 45 degree front edge and you'd have a flag on all four corners so that the horses have information and you've also got a forgiving shape in case somebody rubbed it. Um, so I think, um, you know, just being careful of the shapes of jumps and, you know, sizes and where they go and all the stuff that you, you try to study and try to learn um, in education programs and, and from everybody who's talking about it. So that would be my, my, my least favorite piece. I'm going <laughs> to long straight run to a big square of unforgiving edge. Yeah. So I think especially with like asking questions and making a discussion whenever you have a concern, it's that's just so important. You know, there's no reason not to do it. And whatever mm -hmm. you ask, you'll, def you'll get something out of that conversation. And it doesn't matter, you know, if you're an upper level rider or you're just starting out, ask the questions. Nobody's going to be upset or anything about it. You'll definitely learn something new. So, yeah. Yeah, everybody, because, you know, everybody has a different set of eyes, a different set of experience. So, you know, when you get together and talk about things, um, everybody does have uh, a legitimate reason for speaking <coughs> and um, everybody will be able to be helpful in that discussion. Like you say, it's um, everybody's everybody's experience counts up to a lot of um, good information. So, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a it's a team effort for sure. Yeah. So what levels have you designed for? Um, I've mostly spent my time doing preliminary and down. Mm. Um, I've done uh, intermediate uh, show jumping design, um, you know, because I, I'm qualified to do that as well. Um, so, yeah, mostly mo most of my career has been spent in the in the lower level educational um, uh, position where which I really enjoy because I think education is everything. So what would you say, have you, like, what are the major differences that you'll notice between, you know, those like lower levels and those upper, you know, preliminary levels, um, especially in like the elements and the types of combinations that you're seeing? Um, so definitely um, the lower levels, I believe, should be educational. And in that 
regard, they should be, you know, the horses and the riders should be seeing different shapes and um, different angles, like turning left, turning right, um, you know, going uphill, going downhill, uh, doing um, lots of different approaches, um, colors, you know, different, um, different things that you see and nothing should be tricky. Um, I think that uh, I have no problem with um, the, the beginner novice and novice horses getting clear, clear cross country rounds every time um, because it's just experience and um, it's fun and it's definitely a, uh, you know, it's a, it's an exciting sport and just getting out there on the ground and cantering along is, is exciting. And, um, you know, you don't have to be challenged too badly <laughs> above your sort of expectations. Um, I, I, I just love all the different, um, different shapes, colors, and, um, uh, sighting of all the different jumps. So that is education and it goes right up to preliminary. Um, uh, you know, it, as, as we get up to preliminary and, and beyond that, it, it starts to be a little bit of an examination of skill, um, of boldness, of trust, um, of footwork, of quick, quickness of mind. Um, so, uh, the, this, the, you know, jump widths, the face widths get narrower as you get up there. Um, and, uh, you know, a six foot narrow, so you have six feet of jumpable width at preliminary becomes, you know, challenging. So um, when you put those things on turns and you give yourself, you know, fewer steps to make adjustments, um, you know, quickness comes into play, gymnastic ability, um, you know, practicing at home over gymnastics and series of lines of jumps with, you know, one strides and two strides and three strides in between, all those things educate for that kind of um, skill. And I think that that is probably really a critical factor is the homework factor. Um, so you would expect that somebody going training and up would be practicing those kind of things. Um, you know, of course, at novice, you can have a two stride combination anywhere. Um, so uh, you know, you have to be comfortable with those things as you go out there and start to compete. So, um, the expectation is for the, uh, homework to be done. Um, practicing is, is, is a great thing. Um, so as you go up the levels, just more skill sets with steering and speed control and length of stride, you know, having practice, like knowing, if two jumps are set X distance apart that your horse is going to put in six strides or five strides or seven strides. Um, just getting a feel for what your horse does in given distances um, is really helpful. And, um, and then also just practicing steering. I really uh, consider all the time um, steering with both legs and both hands, like not just pulling on one rein to get somewhere. Um, so those kind of skills, I'm always trying to think, okay, how can, you know, how can this ride, rider at this level get that done without, you know, without, with being smooth again, kind of think of smoothness and rhythm. Um, so, um, you know, you start to get a little bit more testing when you get to prelim. And then of course, when you go to intermediate, it's more so, and advanced becomes, um, a, you know, a test of, of boldness and, um, quick reactions and, um, you know, judgment about speed and that sort of thing. Um, so I think, you know, as in any sport, as you go up the levels, you, you, it's much more demanding of practice and, and, uh, education, you know, understanding like, how does my horse act in this situation? So I think practice is important in staying at a, at a level long enough to be really comfortable before you even consider moving up, even if you should or shouldn't consider moving up. So, um, I don't know. Hopefully that answers a little bit my thoughts on that.
No, that answers a ton. I, I really agree with the practice thing. You know, just looking, taking a look with your trainer about, you know, the level that you're at and what you're going to be seeing on those courses at competitions. And as you put it, just doing that homework, making sure that you are able to effectively and safely do it at home before you take that to a competition is just so important. Yeah, I think it's really, really important. And um, practice makes perfect and perfect practice makes perfect even more often yeah. um yeah and just uh you know being able to have somebody to help you out make decisions help educate you go with you um you know and and uh, like i said earlier in the course design and setting up the team effort and i think really eventers we really kind of have that idea anyway because we all root for each other so we're all on the same team so the more practice and the more camaraderie and more sharing of experience we have, the better. Yeah, definitely. So last episode I found, I spoke with Bevan Dugan and I had been asking her about frangible fences and she started to talk a bit about them. And one of the things she mentioned was something about this system on the frangible fences. Um, it was some like, you know, marking or like code on the frangible fences to determine like a specific level or um, I don't know, like, yeah mode of them and she said i should ask a course designer about that so i was just kind of curious what you had to say about that um well we're finding that frangible fences which are deformable or breakaway yeah. fences have really uh improved the statistics of like injuries and and um you know problems uh with falling um over over the time that we've been using them and um the original um, breakaway thing was a, a pin, an aluminum pin that given enough force that we would put um, a log on top of a pin that was stuck into another upright post. Um, and with a certain amount of force, that pin would break away. And then you could pop, pop that out and put a new pin in for the next horse. Um, so that started the whole idea of pressure and testing, and there's been a lot of um, tons and tons of scientific research put in to it. And there's a lot of information on the safety and education uh, section of the USDA uh, website. Uh, you can get very scientific. Um, I'm not very scientific about it, but um, my, you know, my experience is that it's a really good idea to when we build new jumps. Uh, incorporate the frangible technology. Um, it is expensive. There are grants given to e events uh, if the organizers will um, ask for those um, support systems. Um, the we can get uh, kits to build jumps that are the frangible type. And we, you know, as we go through time, we're getting more and more demanding about must have. Uh, frangible technology uh, in new jumps at um, training level and above, modified and above. Um, and, you know, then we need to retrofit by certain dates uh, the jumps that we can retrofit into te uh, frangible technology. So there's pins and there are clips. There's something called a MIM clip system, which is a hinged system uh, for, you can use them on tables, you can use them on gates, you can use them on oxers, corners, um, and just basic, you know, rail jumps, um, where the rails are attached to hinges, and the hinges are attached to the uprights, so the hinges carry the rail, the top rail, or the top element, um, it's attached to the upright support system and it's it's uh, connected by something that breaks which is a clip um so recently in the last year um a lot of study has been gone gone on with weighing the elements that are attached <laughs> to these um to their you know their uprights and finding out like how much pressure does it actually take for something to collapse. So they've come up with a system now that has some variables and there's yellow clips and there's red clips. Um, and those clips 
indicate, you know, more or less pressure is needed to break those away. Um, things set on angles are done with um, yellow clips, things that are a little bit more straightforward and more solid that you don't want to collapse without, you know, the proper amount of pressure are done with the red clips. Um, so they're all, they're all calculated by how much force does it take to break that clip and how much weight is that clip holding now? So <laughs> it's becoming incredibly complicated. So you're supposed to weigh things like tabletops if you're going to use them um, in a, on a frangible table, which will knock down if a horse like hits the front of it or sits all feet all their feet down on top of it um and so that there's some more information coming in into our systems that uh, give us better information but the the things are working really well um so you'll see red clips you'll see yellow clips and you'll see pins and they're all different uh, uh they're all used in different settings to the best of our experience um, I have watched them activate, and it's amazing when you see, uh, you know, a horse hit the front of a open oxer, and that oxer goes down, and that horse maybe lands and stumbles a little bit. Maybe the rider falls off or doesn't. But um, when you imagine what would have happened without the clip giving away, um, you you can really see the value of it. It's really pretty remarkable. So, um, so it's great that we have those uh, frangible fences. One thing we have seen also is that sometimes riders don't respect them as much because they figure they'll break away. That doesn't mean that it's the rider that ignores the fact that they're going too fast and hits that isn't going to have a fall. So, you know, we need to respect those jumps because those jumps are the ones that it's like, okay, well, we better respect this jump because it could cause some trouble. Yeah. And, um, you know, so when you see a clip, you don't go, oh, good, it's frangible. I'm just going to run at that thing. You go, oh, this is a pretty tricky fence. I think I better be careful here. Yeah. Uh, but we get some great, uh, I think the system of um, the points, the penalty points for activating a, a frangible is great. Because all you have to do is bend a little flap on a, on a mim clip. It doesn't have to break but you're still going to get 11 penalties. So, um, you know, definitely approach the frangible fences with just as much, if not more respect than, uh, um, you know, than the non-frangible. Yeah, definitely. They're really you could, hmm? Yeah, you, you can learn tons by looking at um, the safety and education info yeah. on the web. Yeah, those are definitely a really interesting type of jump. So I was just kind of curious, on the day of the event, what's your job? Like, what are you kind of doing during the competition day? Um, well, uh, the rule says that the course designer should be at the event. That doesn't mean that they have to be at the event. Mm -hmm. um, once everything's approved, uh, the designer does not have to actually be at the event. Although it's really a better idea to be there because you get to see what what you think was going to happen does it really happen yeah. you know um how many strides do they put in that line that you think is going to be four did they do four did they do six did they do three um you know so you get to really observe what what it is that you've um created so that you can say oh that worked perfectly i love that or oh i could have made that a tighter turn or you know something like that so observing the horses jumping the jumps is the is the the act activity <laughs> really just kind of learning more about what you're doing yeah so i was kind of curious how how did you get into this job and what are some ways that a rider who's listening right now who's maybe interested in becoming a course designer how could they set themselves up to make that happen for themselves um well i started out by just showing up <laughs> go do it, just go get involved. Um, you know, I learned uh, a lot and was able to work a lot with uh, other course designers, just helping set jumps, um, especially in the show jumping. Um, I would go to an event just because I was in an area I was competing or whatever, and then I would go to the event and when 
somebody was going to set the show jumps, I would go help them carry the rails. Um, I would hold the end of the tape. I would, um, you know, watch people count strides. Um, so being involved in the work, um, I believe in being in the trenches, I think you should get in and get your hands dirty and, um, you know, just even just, just go to watch, help, whatever. Um, but there are, uh, training programs that are most significant, um, for any official, but course designers have a training, uh, program that is, uh, again, in the education section. Um, you can learn all about that. Um, it gives you all sorts of criteria. Um, you have to apply and then you have to go through, um, the process of getting experience and proving it. Um, so riding. I think is really super, super important, but not everybody is a rider at a upper level that gets to be a course designer. Um, but that certainly is a really good way to sort of know what things are going to feel like. Yeah. Um, and, um, the education program is super cool because you get to talk to all kinds of people. You get all sorts of fun information. Um, you learn the rules. You have to take tests. Um, you know, you get to work with course advisors, uh, from the top levels. They'll come and help you and look at what you've done and say, why don't we change this or do that? Or, you know, this looks good. And I, you know, what, what are you thinking there? And all sorts of conversation happens. That's always educational. So there's a lot of studying and, you know, doing work. Um, and then there's, you know, the educate, the continuing ed which is every three years you have to take a test and go to a program and you can go as every year if you want. But um, yeah, so there's mentors. There is a mentorship program where um, there's preceptors. So you can go work with a preceptor. That's another great way to do it. Um, just something else that has to be done, but also fun. And you could do it, you know, for five years and then go apply to do the program. So yeah, just being interested, I think is the first criteria and then just you know the program is there so it's it's encouraging everybody to go ahead and give it a shot you know let's if you're interested definitely talk to people look at look up the education stuff and um yeah it's uh it's fun yeah especially you know putting yourself out there helping out around the event whether you want to be a course designer or not is always just super helpful that's that's a great way to get yourself recognized as you know just a good person in the area and that also kind of makes me think of um for any young riders who are listening right now if you go on to the area one uh the area one young rider site we offer mentorships over the show season so you can go on there whether you want to be you know a course designer or you know maybe you're interested in becoming a td or a dressage judge you can sign up and you can choose whichever event you're interested in and whatever job you're interested in and you might have the chance to shadow that person the day of an event so that is such a awesome opportunity that i highly recommend you check out in the spring when we start competing again yeah, I think that's a great suggestion because I really think that, um, you know, my feeling is that, that the boots on the ground and uh, you know, doing the work, getting dirty, you know, seeing where things work, where they don't, getting the stick out from underneath the jump, uh, you know, putting down gravel, making the footing right, you know, digging a hole so a, uh, you know, a uh, uh, puddle can drain, that kind of stuff, <laughs> which is all that important uh, work that goes on. Uh, to make everybody uh, as safe and, and uh, ha have as good a time as possible. There's lots to do. Yeah. So I think we're kind of nearing the end of this episode. So do you have any finishing thoughts that you might want to share with our listeners? Um, well, just really kind of um, realizing that uh, everybody's out for the fun of the sport, it's very exciting, it's fun, it's um, challenging, it takes a lot of guts and a lot of uh, practice and um, uh, it, we're all in it together and we all work together. So I think that you can do anything and there's lots of resources. So don't be afraid to speak up, don't be afraid to step forward and uh, say that you want to learn something or that you want to just hang out or whatever. Um, 
the more the merrier. Uh, so yeah, there's lots to learn and a lot of people out there with that really are happy to help anybody who wants to learn anything in the sport because we all love it and are passionate about it. Otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. So thank you so much for not only, you know, doing what you do in area one and eventing, designing these courses, but also for coming on today and chatting with me. You're more than welcome, Rory. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you for listening to today's episode. There's so much you can learn by experiencing and asking questions, so don't be afraid to ask the questions you have, and if you're hoping to have a job in eventing or you just want to further your understanding and education within the sport, look out for our Young Rider Mentorship opportunities over the summer. As always, we'll end this the way every cross-country course starts. Have a great ride.